Well, good morning. Uh, I'll officially call to order the regular meeting of the Coachella Valley Water District Board of Directors here in Palm Desert. Today is October 8th, 2024. And would you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Prior to roll call, I'd like to make clear for the record that this meeting um, of this meeting should be reflected in the minutes that this at least a portion of this board meeting is conducted pursuant to California Government Code Section 54953, in that Director Aguilar is in Colo. Oh. Oh. Yeah, that's Hi, Director Kaloa. Anyways, Hawaii, and we'll be participating by speakerphone in accordance with the Ralph M. Brown Act. The teleconference location has been identified on the agenda for this meeting. Um, Clerk Bermudez, will you please call the roll? Yes, good morning, President Powell. Here. Vice President Estrada. Here. Director Bianca will be absent for this meeting. Uh, Director Aguilar. Here. Director Nelson. Here. Thank you. Great. Director Aguilar, can you hear me well? I can't, John. Uh, were you able to hear our proceedings on this end up till now? Yes. Do you have a copy of the agenda for this meeting? I do. Boy, it sounds like you're in the room. It's really a good audio. Uh, have you posted the agenda at the location where you are? I have. Is your location reasonably accessible to the public such that any member of the public could participate in this teleconference from your location if he or she wished to do so? It is. Okay, good. Um, is there any member of the public there with you? Is it not at the moment? Not at the moment. All right. Well, let us know if someone shows up, and so we'll make sure sure that all votes for this meeting are um, taken by roll call. Great. Um, let's see. Then we're going to move on to. Additions, deletions, and adjustments for the agenda, and um, we do have an addition to closed session pursuant to Government Code Section 54954.2. Uh, staff determined a need to add conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation. Initiation of litigation pursuant to paragraph 4 of subdivision D of Section 54956.9. One potential case. This came. Staff, this item came to staff's attention after the posting of the agenda and outside of the period allowed to amend the agenda. So do I have a motion from the board to add this item to the closed session? So moved. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. And a ro roll call vote, please. Sure. President Powell? Aye. Vice President Estrada? Yes. Director Aguilar? Aye. And Director Nelson. Aye. Thank you. Oro. Thank you. So with that, that passed and the, that item is now added to the closed session agenda. Are there any other changes? No, sir. We know of? No. Is there anybody wishing to make public comment at this time? Does not appear so, sir. No. Um, Let's see, then we're on to the consent calendar, items 5, A, B, and C. I'll, I wanted to pull 5B just to add a couple questions. Um, is there a motion to approve the balance of the consent calendar? Yeah, I'll move the uh, balance of the consent calendar. Second. A second. A roll call vote, please. President Powell? Aye. Vice President Estrada? Yes. Director Aguilar? Yes. And Director Nelson? Aye. Thank you. Okay, so 5B. Hi. I know it's for cutting, <laughs> precise cutting. I just d don't know how we're going to use it, and I didn't see. I, I'm curious more than anything sure. else. What, so what is this for? I'll just set the stage, and then I'll turn it over to my welding crew chief, Robert Taylor. Um, Robert. They've actually been asking for this for, for probably five years. And it finally, I, got, I finally agreed to put it in the budget. 
I think it's really important with some of the sophisticated welding that they do at this point in time. Uh, they work on a lot of our different systems and then the ability to actually do 3D and cut to that 3D to like two one thousand seven inch is just, you know, it's worth its weight in gold. But with that, I guess. Yeah, sure, I guess what, so what items are we cutting? Sure. And what purpose does it serve? Yeah. Sure. Uh, good morning, President Powell. Good morning, yeah. members of the board. Uh, so with this machine, it's, um, it really streamlines a lot of the stuff that we do as far as cutting abilities and, and the speed of it and loss of uh, uh, material. So basically one of the instances I can uh, relate to is if we are cutting, uh, for example, some of these modified um, flanges that are four bolt hole flanges, uh, we cut them out of one inch steel and it usually takes probably my best guy, maybe four or five hours per one to do. Oh. Whereas this can do it in about five minutes or less. Whoa. So it's, oh. it's much more precise, it's much faster and less material waste. So these are custom parts that you, you can't buy off of the, yes, off the all shelf? all those are discontinued. Discontinued. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, so connections and flanges and things. Yes, yes. Connectors. Much more than just that, too. It's, more than that. Yeah. Well, a lot of the stuff that we do for irrigation as well, like locking devices and stuff like that, we can throw a 5 by 10 sheet of material on there, and what would take a full day to cut all these things would take a matter of minutes. So it can really streamline a lot of the stuff that we do. Maybe we should have a tour once we get the thing up and running. So Absolutely. People can go down and see for themselves how effective it is. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. All right, fair enough. Thank you. I move approval of the plasma cutter. Second. Um, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. President Powell. Aye. Vice President Estrada. Aye. Director Aguilar. Aye. And Director Nelson. Aye. Thank you. 4 0. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> I do want to see it. 7A. Um, so we're into the action calendar. This is the resolution for the DCP. And Robert, I believe you have a presentation. Sure. Good morning. Um, Good morning. It's been a few years since I've uh, stood front, in front of this board to talk about the Delta Commands project and I'd like to take this opportunity to do a few things today. I think uh, one is to kind of give you an update of what's been going on since you know, the last request, I think it was back in 22, and then to also perhaps uh, ask the board to consider uh, a few actions, uh, which I'll list here. Um, I think one of the more substantive uh, goals that we achieved uh, last year, and you'll hear a little bit more about it um, from one of our guests today, is the completion of the uh, California Environmental Quality Act, um, uh, the final EIR, which was uh, published, I think it was last December. And uh, as a responsible party, uh, this organization uh, will need to uh, make findings of CEQA and then CEQA guidelines. Um, and then adopt the CEQA findings of fact and also uh, adopt a statement of um, overriding considerations under CEQA. So that's the administrative part uh, you know, to proceed with this project. And then uh, more substantively, uh, this board also needs to consider authorizing funding of uh, CBWD share uh, currently at 3.78% uh, of the project uh, for the pre-construction work uh, that's going to continue into 26 and 27. Uh, not to exceed $11,340,000. Uh, $11, uh, um, and really kind of cut to the chase, uh, staff has done analysis uh, on this uh, cost impact uh, to the State Water Project Fund and has determined that there will be no impacts uh, you know, based on our current rates. So uh, with that, um, I'd like to turn the floor over to uh, two of our guests that we have. Uh, Carrie Buckman, from, uh, and she is the uh, primary environmental lead for uh, Department of Water Resources on this project. And then uh, Graham Bradner, who's the uh, executive director of the uh, uh, Design Construction Authority, who's been supporting DWR and us on these efforts. Yeah, thank you, and welcome. Yeah, I look forward to hearing. Um, I guess just sort of to tee up what, what, our, what my interest in this is, um, it seems like a necessary project um, but what happens to the project? I think we're 
much smaller than two of the larger, like you have Matt is number one and I think Kern is number two. Um, what happens if they aren't supporting it? And I'm just curious since I don't think they've taken this action yet. Um, so if you could include that in there um, of what happens with the project if they're not supportive. No, the, uh, great question, President Powell. And I think we are uh, among one of the earlier <clears throat> agencies to go. I think uh, up to now, I think there's been maybe four or uh, five uh, that have gone. But, you know, you're right. Uh, most of them have been a little smaller. I think the uh, larger one, uh, you know, who went last week was Santa Clarita Water, uh, Santa Clarita Valley Water Agency. Uh, and I think they're a little less than 3% of the project. Um, so what happens to the project if uh, Kern and Metropolitan, you know, just put names on, on these two larger agencies, don't go? Well, they fund, they're probably about, uh, you know, 65% of the project. Uh, and if they're not in, it's a gap way too big to be filled. And I, I think we, we have, we, we, quite simply, we don't have a project. But as you stated, um, I think, you know, all of us feel this is a necessary part uh, to stop the, or to, boost up the reliability of the project, you know, for future years. And I know Metropolitan yeah. is working and engaging very hard on discussions internally. So, right. Okay. That's probably not as satisfying an answer. No, sure. but I, you see our, I, that's my point of view on it anyway. So, you know, maybe how to thank you characterize your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for having us, President Powell and members of the board. We're really happy to be here and talk more about Delta Conveyance. I'm going to start a little bit with sort of emphasizing again the importance of the project, why we as the state think this is so critical and we're moving this forward, and a little bit of the status of planning and permitting, which is sort of my end of the, the arena, and then Graham will come talk more about the cost estimate and the benefit costs. So really, the, the large reason that we're looking at this project is because we know we need to prepare for climate change. Uh, we've been seeing some of the things, you know, we've been planning for climate change for quite some time, but really we've been starting to see some of these trends in the past few years. While we know that the amount of runoff could be highly variable, it could decrease up to 32% or increase to 47% depending on different models. But there are trends that are true across that wide variety. Uh, we expect to see more precipitation falling as rain instead of snow, more extreme drought and flood cycles, and more intense precipitation events scattered within dry stretches. And we've seen some of those. So, you know, in the past few years, we had two incredibly dry years followed by an incredibly wet year. Uh, also, if people remember in the fall of 2021, the year, water year 21-22 was a critically dry year, but in October we had a very large rain event. We had over five inches of rain in Sacramento and set records. And in December, we also had a really large rain event between Christmas and New Year's. And being able to capture those kinds of events is critical to being able to manage water within this changing climate. So as water, as the climate changes, we are less able to manage that system with the, the water management tools that we have. Uh, with less snowpack and more rain, we need to be able to capture the water when it's available. And at times where currently our system is constrained by environmental regulations in the South Delta. So we can't currently capture that water as well in reservoirs because of flood control restrictions and in the Delta because of environmental restrictions. So having an additional facility to be able to capture water when it's available and move it is critical to being able to manage under this changing condition. So the State Water Project is an incredibly important piece of infrastructure, not just to those who rely on it, but really broader than that. The service area is 27 million people, and I think we hear a lot about the statistic that if, if California was its own nation, it would be the fifth largest economy in the world. If the State Water Project service area was its own economy, it would be the eighth largest in the world. Mm -hmm. So this is this project is not just uh, not just directly supporting those who who get the drinking water, but it really is supporting an economy that is extending beyond the borders. The current water supply is about 2.5 million acre feet per year on average of deliveries to urban and agricultural customers. But we know that that's going to change in the future, that climate change will decrease that yield, climate change and sea level rise, by about 22% by 2070. Additionally, if there is a seismic event in the Delta and there is damage to the Delta levees, 
the water would move up into the delta, the seawater, and we would have an extended outage of the delta conveyance or of the existing conveyance, the bank's facility, that could extend up to almost a year with really degraded water quality for another year. Having an additional point of diversion would help with that issue. So this looks at the, the issue that we're facing regarding climate change. If we do nothing for the state water project, we look at a decrease of about 22%. So from about 2.5 million acre feet to under 2 million acre feet by 2070. And that is because of the combined forces of climate change, which is moving the precipitation to a different time of year, as well as sea level rise, which means that there is more water needed to move out through the delta to maintain salinity in the delta. So with the Delta Conveyance Project, we are able to uh, restore about 400,000 acre feet of supply to the state, to the state water project. This is uh, incredibly important facing the, when we face these climate change conditions. So this here is a really interesting example of how it would have helped. I think you probably have heard about the steelhead issues in the South Delta this year. This year there were steelhead that were collecting near the South Delta facilities. And we experienced more regulation of our South Delta pumping plant than we have in recent years, um, quite a bit more. They just overlapped in a way that, that was unusual. And if we had had a different place to divert the water where we weren't facing the same kind of steelhead conditions, we would have been able to divert 941,000 acre feet of water, which is about enough water for over 9.8 million people or nearly 3.3 million households. The points that we're looking at in the North Delta do not have the same fishery restrictions in the South Delta because they are an on-river system, so it functions differently. It's in a different place in the Delta, so they have different kinds of requirements. So just a little bit about where we are in the planning and permitting. Uh, as Robert mentioned, we did, re we did reach a major milestone at the end of 2023 where we finalized the environmental impact report and decided to move forward with the project with the Bethany Alternative. Uh, the Corps of Engineers is the lead on the final environmental impact statement, which we're expecting later this year. So we've moved into these other environmental permitting processes that are expected to extend through the end of 2026. I'm not sure if everyone was at ACWA this year, but you might have heard the governor, and, and one of the key things that he emphasized is the importance to him of this project and his commitment to completing the permitting by the end of his term at the end of 2026. Uh, this is a commitment that I feel very, uh, very directly, I'll say. Uh, so it's, it's really a strong commitment on his part. So we are working now to complete Endangered Species Act consultation and California Endangered Species Act consultation this year. Uh, we have started our water rates process and the hearing is expected to start in January. And then Delta Plan consistency is uh, on track to start later in 2025. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Graham to talk a little bit about the project itself and the cost estimate. Quick second. Um, good morning. So um, as Carrie described, the Department of Water Resources finalized the environmental impact report and selected the Bethany Reservoir alignment as the project for further study and advancement. Uh, so the DCA ha has been working on an updated cost estimate for that project. Uh, the main purpose being to feed the, the statewide feasibility analysis, which I will touch on uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so I'm going to talk first about the cost estimate work, the update that we've been performing, uh, and then talk a bit about some of the, the innovations work we're doing. So there's the, the project described in the EIR, which is a relatively conservative concept. And then we've been starting to further evaluate potential refinements and innovations to help manage costs. And, and that's really a large part of what we want to be doing going forward uh, between now and the completion of those remaining permit activities. So the Bethany Reservoir Alignment, it's the 6,000 cubic foot per second project. Uh, I'd characterize the overall design level at this point as about a 10% overall design. Uh, it includes two intakes on the main stem of the Sacramento River in the North Delta. Uh, 45 miles of 36 foot internal diameter tunnel that would connect those intakes in the north down to a new pumping plant in the south delta. Uh, this would be a new pumping plant that, that adds redundancy to the existing state water project facilities. So this pumping plant would be dedicated to lifting that water out of the tunnel and delivering it directly to Bethany Reservoir. <clears throat> Bethany Reservoir is essentially a wide spot in the California aqueduct. That's where the existing bank's pumping plant discharges to 
Also, the South Bay pumping plant, which feeds the portions of the Bay Area, takes water out of Bethany Reservoir. So that's a, a real important sort of meeting spot for all the water within the State Water Project. And the, the new discharge structure would connect directly there and, and move that water from the North Delta intakes into Bethany Reservoir. Uh, the estimate is a, is a bottoms-up estimate principally, although we did multiple uh, approaches and reconciliations through the estimating process. But the main estimate is a bottoms-up deterministic estimate, thinking about all the activities that would be required for the project, the equipment, duration, labor, building up that number as opposed to what would traditionally be done typically at this stage of a project kind of working top down, just looking at like uh, benchmarking sort of what typically does percentage does this represent of an overall estimate, et cetera. We did that as well as a way to, to double check our work, but the main estimate is bottoms up. It's uh, in 2023 real dollars. These are undiscounted dollars, meaning they do not account for the time value of money, uh, but that is accounted for in the benefit cost analysis. So the economic feasibility work does account for all of those time impacts, but the, the base estimate itself is 2023 dollars. Uh, it's a class four estimate. There are some class five aspects uh, in terms of, of uh, the status of our understanding, and that's mainly along the tunnel alignment. Uh, we do have some pretty significant gaps along that, that eastern Bethany alignment, and uh, that, that also is, is an area of focus for the next few years. We'd like to be doing additional geotech investigations to better characterize the conditions over there and help us refine the design assumptions and again kind of working towards that the innovations topic teeing up the best possible project once the permits are complete and then lastly we've assumed a design bid build procurement process uh, for this estimate we needed to develop uh, a, a sequence and schedule for this entire estimate and so the design bid build procur procurement is the most conservative from a schedule and cost perspective so here's our updated estimate, uh, just jumping right to it. Down at the bottom of the table on the right, it's $20.12 billion in 2023 dollars. Uh, you can see the breakdown above the total construction cost is about 75% of that estimate. Uh, the What we call other program costs, which includes the soft cost labor, land acquisition. I want to point out we've got uh, just under a billion dollars of environmental mitigation included in the estimate in this other program cost category. Uh, we've also got uh, $200 million of community benefits included in the cost estimate. So all of these are already <coughs> plugged in to that $20.12 billion. Uh, I mentioned reconciliations were completed in the develop of, development of this estimate. First, you know, we're, I'm reflecting the bottoms up uh, costs on the right-hand side of the table. We actually did a top-down estimate as well and then went through a formal reconciliation process to resolve any discrepancies. Uh, we also reconciled this estimate with our master program schedule where we cost loaded everything just to make sure again we've double checked and triple checked our numbers to make sure that things are lining up. Uh, and then lastly we compared it back to the 2020 cost assessment which was for a bit of a you know, different project but we went through the work of making it as close to apples to apples as we could and I'll show you that on the next slide. Uh, included in the estimate, in addition to the items I pointed out, we have close to $500 million in direct risk treatment costs or risk mitigation costs. Those are included directly in the total construction costs uh, already shown on the right-hand side, so they're, they're essentially buried in those numbers. Uh, we've got a total construction contingency of 30% included in the estimate, and then down in the other program cost category, it's mainly 15 to 30%. Uh, only 0% applies to the Community Benefits Program and a couple other fixed items, but in general between 15 and 30% within the other program costs. So here's our comparison to the 2020 cost assessment. Uh, the $20.12 billion is inside the, you know, the first column inside the gold box. Uh, then as you look at the second column, that's the 2020 assessment, uh, $15.9 billion totaled at the bottom. Uh, this was uh, for a different alignment, but as I said, we went through the, the work of trying to, to make this an apples to apples reasonable comparison. Uh, we took that $15.9 billion and escalated it according to the Bureau of Reclamation's construction cost trend data, uh, which shows uh, inflation of 26.8% from 2020 to 2023. So just taking that $15.9 billion, escalating it across using that index, we end up at $20.17 billion, a very close number to where we, we ended up with our bottoms-up estimate. Uh, to me, this speaks to the quality of the work done back in 2020. You know, although there was a lot of unknowns at that time, there was a higher contingency and several other placeholders included. Now we have a, a more detailed and robust estimate but uh, and a refinement of that contingency, but we're still landing in a very similar place. So 
uh, to me, I think this speaks to the confidence uh, that I have in the work that, uh, that's been performed to develop these costs. So now I'll shift gears to the cost savings innovations. Um, these are potential innovations to reduce cost impacts uh, or improve constructability. Uh, they're really focused on validating design assumptions associated with the concept design and the EIR, uh, collecting and incorporating new geotechnical data to help us refine those assumptions and, and test some of those conservative assumptions built into the analysis, but also leave room for industry innovation. Uh, we still have a few years before we would be approaching construction. There's a lot of opportunity to innovate uh, underground construction, especially tunnels and uh, large infrastructure is a constantly innovating industry and we want to make sure that we're staying on top of that, providing room for that uh, and also allowing for that in, in the understanding and description of the project. Uh, but to be clear, the innovations that we're analyzing now do not represent changes to the project description. Uh, EWR will have to, to consider any potential refinements uh, and, and uh, overlay the permit requirements as we move forward. Uh, an example on the right hand side is, is the new pumping plant, the Bethany Reservoir pumping plant. It's largely a below ground facility. You see the, the flat top, that's the ground surface with the gantry cranes and, and the awning structure. The rest of that is all below ground. It's a tremendous amount of diaphragm wall box structures connecting the tunnel to the pumping plant. Uh, that's an interior wet well in the middle and then straddled by the pump bay. So all of that is inside uh, these deep box structures. And so what we've been looking at is potentially a replacing those diaphragm wall structures with a, a tunnel extension from the uh, reception shaft. And so that's the pipe that you see on the lower image that's, that's entering into the middle of the pumping plant. Uh, and then replacing the rectangular box uh, pump bays with a series of interlocking shafts. It's a much more efficient construction. We save a tremendous amount of construction material quantities as well as schedule. Uh, this particular example is about $140 million just in quantity reductions, not accounting for the potential schedule and risk benefits. So this is just one example. Uh, we're looking at 19 different innovations at the moment, continuing to refine and expand on those. Uh, those 19 early innovations right now, we see potential reductions of about 6% of the total mm -hmm. cost or one and a quarter billion. To take this estimate down from 20.1 to 18.9. Uh, and that's early stage analysis. This is the type of work that we really think uh, we can continue to refine the project and, and uh, bring forward the, you know, as best we can um, a better project for full consideration at the time of implementation. So I mentioned the benefit cost analysis. Uh, this was performed by Berkeley Research Group. Uh, the cost side of the analysis is first the, the con updated construction cost estimate that, that we just reviewed. In addition, an estimate of operations and, and maintenance cost was added to the cost side of the ledger. And then the unmitigated environmental impacts. So the, the mitigation is included in the estimate itself, so that's in the first bullet. But there's the unmitigated environmental impacts, which the economics team also assigned a cost to and included in the analysis, so a pretty conservative approach. On the benefit side, it's largely the water supply reliability that you heard Carrie describe uh, in terms of the, the ongoing uh, mitigating the, the negative impacts of climate change on those water supply benefits, also to a smaller degree water quality. And then there's the seismic benefits. Uh, there's a pretty detailed analysis of this in the benefit cost analysis, but uh, although it's a, a very large and expensive event, if it were to occur, the relatively low probability of a large seismic event helps to keep that from dominating the analysis. It, it's really the water supply benefits that is the principal benefit in, in, the, in the computations. Um, so the analysis, by the economics team found that the benefit cost ratio is 2.2. So for every dollar spent on the project, a benefit of 2.2 would be returned. So uh, you know, it readily passes the benefit cost test. Typically something over one would, would be a starting point. You'd like to see something north of 1.5, uh, but 2.2 provides pretty significant buffer for, for continued understanding and, and uh, sort of evolution of this process. We have a lot of information available to the public. Um, this is where, through these QR codes, both the benefit cost analysis report as well as the cost estimate report are, are both available to the public. There's a lot of information that we have out there and transparency is a real priority for us through this process. So all that information is available. And I, I think with that, we would welcome any questions. Cool, thank you. So um, we decided to provide the
the uh, the background and update first, and then I'll <clears throat> bring it and, and close out the rest of the discussion, uh, if that's okay. Um, so, you know, so, some of the slides uh, hopefully are a bit rhetorical, but uh, just wanted to um, make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of like looking at the statistics uh, of the importance of the state water project, you know, to this valley. So uh, the state water project, uh, CVWD became one of the original signers uh, to this back in 1963. And over time, we've grown our uh, Table A allocation, our contracted amount from a little bit over 23,000 to what it is currently today, 138,350, and then plus another 9,500 with uh, Rosedale Rio Bravo. So that brings a total up to a little bit over 147,000 acre feet. Uh, we've invested uh, as an agency about a billion dollars uh, since that time, and we've reaped uh, 1.8 million acre feet of water deliveries uh, that's been put into white water. So if you just do the simple calculations on this, um, it's about $556 an acre foot through all year types. And these are, you know, real deliveries and real costs. Um, and I think, you know, we all realize the importance of the uh, Metropolitan CBWD and uh, DWA exchange agreement uh, by which uh, Whitewater uh, would not have received as much benefits as it does, you know, from the Colorado River exchange. And then the, uh, the panel, uh, the graph on the right-hand side, you know, just simply shows uh, the total uh, amount that has been recharged, including desert waters, uh, table A, and so on. Uh, so without it, uh, I think we would be down uh, close to 4 million acre feet uh, without, you know, the, the benefits of the state water, th these exchange <coughs> agreements. So uh, I think one of the questions that's probably resonating through the board's minds as you're doing the consideration is, you know, do we still need uh, the Delta Conveyance Project? We've been with this for a long time. Um, so I think this is a, uh, this graph on the uh, left uh, has been shown many times, uh, but I think it's no less uh, important. Um, I think you see that dashed line, uh, straight, uh, dashed straight vertical line uh, in 2007 where there's a sharp uh, decrease uh, on table A allocations um, and you know to the left is pre wanger days um, so where the allocation was uh, close to 90 percent uh, and then after that um, you know and these are real deliveries uh, we're seeing 44 percent uh, from post 2007 until today so uh, this you know we're, we're experiencing you know the real decrease in reliability as a consequence of the changing hydrology and then also uh, the regulatory pressures that's being exerted on the uh, state water project system um, and DWR has um, every few years they'll update uh, their uh, estimation on what the project is able to deliver uh, going out uh, into future years uh, the very latest iteration uh, came out I think it was, it was finalized earlier this year, uh, was the 2023 delivery capability report. And in essence, and I think Carrie's probably in a better position to uh, talk about this, but uh, I'll go ahead and take a crack at it. Uh, they use 100 years worth of hydrology, uh, going, uh, going all the way back to 1922. And with uh, different conditions, they say, okay, you know, what is the uh, state water project capable of uh, with and without the project? And so the baseline scenario, they're showing about uh, 58% uh, in 2020. And now realizing the fact that 2020, you know, we didn't see 58% reliability. This is just simply for modeling purposes. Uh, and going in the future uh, with climate change, uh, they're seeing 41 to 50%. Uh, and 41% is in the 27 num 2020, 2070 numbers. So uh, I think it's pretty clear to say that uh, the climate change will have some uh, drastic impacts, uh, as, as Carrie mentioned before. Uh, with no, if we don't uh, execute further action. Uh, there's two other pieces of consideration I think the board uh, is already aware of, but I just want to highlight for you. I think one is, uh, you know, this district actually not just serves, um, you know, this particular area, but uh, we're also uh, a partner on the, uh, the regional urban water management plan, uh, which is so critical, I think, for the, uh, to make sure the water supply uh, is there. Uh, for all the cities uh, in, in, this, in this area. So uh, the DCP is already baked in uh, into that plan. Um, and then uh, we have the not so uh, inconsequential uh, decision on the post-2026 uncertainty on the Colorado River, which is still kind of working its way through. And it's probably gonna take a few more, year, quite a, a few more years before we get uh, to some uh, resolution on that particular issue. 
Okay, uh, this is a rather busy slide, but uh, we were trying to uh, put everything uh, on one slide so that uh, you know the board has all the information at your fingertips. Um, and I think going from left to right, uh, I think you know this agency has been with this project through all its different iterations you know, for a long time, um, probably even before uh, 2013. But what I want to highlight is uh, on the you know the current Delta conveyance part and you know, how much we paid and uh, how much. Uh, you know, we're expecting uh, to pay if we stay with the project. So um, if you look at the bottom, uh, the bottom blue arrow, uh, I kind of break down the uh, Graham's number of 20.1 billion uh, into a few segments here. So uh, there's, I, there's a, a, a section uh, pre-2029 or so that I kind of characterize as pre-construction. Uh, so this is, you know, permitting, design, I think everything to get us to kind of a shovel-ready state. And that number, as we know today, is a little less than $906 million. Uh, our total, at, uh, if we stay at 3.78%, is $34.2 million. Uh, out of that, uh, CVWD has already uh, spent $12.9 million, which is that uh, green arrow right above uh, the blue. Uh, and that was uh, through previous board actions. Um, that you authorized in uh, 2020 and 2022. So that brings us to where we are today. We got a new cost estimate uh, of 20.1 billion. Um, and I think one of the things I did, did not say is, um, you know, kind of break it down this fashion and why is it pre uh, paygo funding up until 2028 uh, or 29? It's because of a project of this size um, anything can really you know, stop it in its tracks. I think one of which the um, Department of Water Resources is extremely concerned about, as well as state water contractors, is if we uh, start uh, going into this project and start issuing bonds uh, without validating uh, the authority of Department of Water Resources to construct this project and then therefore issue bonds, then any opposition can come in, uh, you know, file their lawsuit and put a grinding halt to the process. So I think uh, DWR, in consultation with the contractors, uh, made the decision uh, in the early 2020s to say, okay, let's uh, do a validation action in the courts first, uh, get that out of the way, validate uh, through a, a judge that we do have the right to do this, and therefore we can go out uh, to the bond market with a clean bill of health. Uh, as it, with anything legal uh, related, uh, it takes time. So quite frankly, uh, we're hoping that 2028 will get a final resolution to this. I know it's a long time. I don't think COVID helped uh, in terms of like, you know, the case, um, you know, uh, moving movement of cases. So in essence, until we get to that point, uh, we have to go operate uh, sort of on the uh, PAYGO system. Now that doesn't really, um, I mean, that affects the, you know, DWR's ability to bond, but Right now, I think the uh, all the participants are paying, um, you know, using whatever instruments that we're allowed to. Uh, in our case, we'll be using the uh, uh, property taxes, you know, from um, <clears throat> as authorized to do. So, the panel on the uh, between 2026 and 2028, you'll see like the cost breakdown. So uh, we're seeking 11.3 million, which is in the circle, uh, 4.5 million and uh, uh, 6.8 million for 26 and 27 respectively. Now these numbers uh, represent about 5% uh, of the total state water project tax, uh, a little bit less than 5%. So um, the staff has already kind of baked these costs in. Um, I show 2028 numbers, even though that's a question mark right now, we don't really know uh, if that's gonna be an ask, but um, you know, so if uh, we come to the point in, you know, 27 and we find out, okay, you know, the uh, validation action hasn't proceeded as uh, quickly as we wanted to, uh, we will be coming back to the board uh, at that point uh, for perhaps another 10 million to get us to 2029. Um, I'm not gonna cover this too much, but again, this is just um, a resolutions by resolution uh, look uh, at what the board has done uh, in the last, you know, 10 plus years, um, you know, in support of the different iterations uh, of the tunnel project. So um, a few more slides that are uh, more directed towards the uh, water supply impact. So I think 
Kerry Buck, Buckman uh, showed uh, 403,000 acre feet of benefits, uh, you know, from the project on average, and that's in 2070. Um, so I'm providing three different uh, stack bar graphs to kind of show uh, the exercise that DWR did when they went through their modeling. So in 2020, which is what they call the baseline, and the 2020 scenario obviously has been passed. Um, and then we have two more climate change scenarios for 2040 and 2070, recognizing the fact that the project is uh, not going to be completed until 20, 2045. So you can see the steady decline in um, the yield uh, in the state water project to CBWD. So just as a reminder, our table A is 138,350 uh, acre feet. So we're declining from 80,000 acre feet in, uh, against the 2020 baseline to uh, 69,000 and 57,000 respectively for 40, uh, 2040 and 2070. Uh, so at the 2070 mark, we'll be down to 41% reliability without uh, any additional actions. So uh, kind of putting the uh, benefits of the uh, Delta Conveyance Project on this and the ability to kind of capture and move wet water uh, when the hydrology is favorable, uh, we can, I think at the worst case in 2070, we'll see about 11% increase uh, at 15,200 or so uh, acre feet. So uh, that brings our reliability up to 52%. Uh, I mean, not, not a fantastic number, but certainly a lot better than 41%. So I think some of the things that I uh, just want to remind um, you know, all of us is that you know, we use the state project water as a basis of exchange with Metropolitan Water District you know, to kind of benefit you know, the whole Southern California region. Um, and I think uh, President Powell asked a really good question. Uh, what happens if Metropolitan is not in it? Well, we really don't have much of a project. I mean, it's just too big of a hole to fill. But uh, we're hopeful that uh, Metropolitan's um, board and staff, you know, sees the wisdom and continue with this project. Um, so I think uh, Kerry also mentioned there's an additional 941,000 acre feet that could have been available in this year with, the, uh, with this tunnel. And I just want to highlight the fact that this was not um, included in the modeling scenarios here. Uh, and it's because it's such a one-off. And, uh, but you know, as the hydrology changes, as the environmental restrictions uh, get tighter, um, you know, will there be more years like 2024? I, you know, I don't know, but I think it's much better to have a tunnel in place uh, to be able to take advantage of that. And then I think one of the biggest questions is, you know, if we're not in this project, um, how will we cope, you know, with the loss of the 15,200 acre feet uh, a year, you know, without it, without the DCP? So um, no, no presentation on this uh, would be complete without some discussion about costs. And uh, we were really uh, having a hard time trying to figure out what, you know, best to, to present to the board that would be you know, somewhat meaningful. So what we decided uh, at this stage is to just show the raw 2023 costs. Um, there's a lot of different ways we can do this, but you know, we, did, we did not escalate uh, these costs just because again, I think any assumptions you make are probably not gonna be correct. Uh, and then certainly financing, you know, we don't know what you know, that's gonna look like uh, when we do have to go to financing and you know, say 2029, for instance. So the uh, stack bar on the far uh, left uh, shows the raw total costs. Uh, uh, that also includes operations and maintenance. And what we said was for a project of this size, and this is what Dr. Sunding also used in his benefit cost analysis, is a 100-year life. Um, so for our 3.78% of the 20.1 billion, we get the 761 million uh, on the capital costs. So that, if we're gonna have to pay it off today, that's how much we would have to have cash in hand. Uh, we also took the uh, operating uh, uh, scenario costs that were uh, provided to us by the state water contractors, and uh, we come out with about a hundred, you know, about one hundred twenty million dollars, uh, a little bit less than one hundred twenty million dollars for the entire one hundred years of operation. So a little bit over a million dollars a year for a combined total of eight hundred seventy-nine million dollars, and so this is over a hundred years' life. Um, then subsequently, kind of moving from left to right. Um, I just simply put the uh, CBWD historical numbers uh, just as a basis of comparison. So that's $556 an acre foot. So that's real numbers and real water that we obtain. Uh, 
the DCP number uh, of $2023. Okay, so this is uh, simply the $879 million, uh, so the 100-year uh, service life in $2023, uh, divided by the benefits of the water that we're getting over the 100-year period, which is uh, 1.523 million acre feet. So that simple calculation yields about $578 an acre foot. Now, I will caveat that this number, uh, there's no finance, there's no escalation, there's no transportation costs. This is just simply for the raw cost of the, uh, the project <clears throat> as, we, you know, as we're contemplating it now. Um, and then uh, Graham didn't go, go into a lot of details uh, about Dr. Sunding's number, but uh, the benefit cost number that he came out with that yielded the 2.2 uh, BC ratio was 1325 um, an acre foot. And I am not an economist. I try to understand uh, what, what he did. He discounted both the dollars of the project as well as the, the benefits. Uh, and it's way beyond my comprehension to try to explain what Dr. Sunning did. But this is a number that is out um, in the media. So I just want to show it uh, for comparison. OK. Um, so the planned activities for 25 and 20 through 27, uh, just very quickly. I think uh, Kerry did a really good job of kind of talking about, you know, the governor's um, desire to uh, finish the permitting process, uh, you know, before his term is up. So there's uh, a huge effort of uh, consultation with the different uh, fishery agencies and then uh, the Water Board and the Delta Stewardship Council to move this process, you know, to a place where we're completed with our permits. Um, Graham kind of talked about, you know, the importance of fin finishing up the engineering or making more substantial progress on engineering design so that it could actually be bitted out in a meaningful manner. And then, you know, there's some more environmental mitigation, land acquisition right away and uh, so on that we need to do. Uh, and, you know, obviously stakeholder outreach is a huge component of this program. So um, more important, uh, what, what are future CVWD board actions? So with this, we have to go through uh, a contract amendment uh, to kind of include uh, the project into um, our existing contract. Uh, so this probably won't be done until early 2027. And then obviously the next pre-construction funding, um, you know, if needed uh, before the, uh, the decision to continue. Um, so I think with that, uh, here's the requested actions again and be happy to um, answer any questions. And uh, I think Graham and Kerry are also available as well. Thank you. Yeah, you know the the one thing that hit, strikes me is it seems. I mean, we're approving funding for more than a year from now. I mean, we don't even do our budgeting, but a year and you know, year by year, and yet this one's way out there. Right. Um, why is it? Why now? Why are we doing this now? Why so early? So um, that's a good question. Um, from our perspective, um, the, the DCA, we've been operating at a pretty standard budget on the order of somewhere between 20, 30, maybe $40 million per year. It's been um, primarily to support DWR's permitting activities, providing all the engineering resources necessary for that. Uh, however, we're now starting to think about the implementation phase. We're not there yet, but we have a pretty significant ramp up between now and 2027 and beyond. So in order for us to, to sort of, if you looked at that plot, it's a pretty steep ramp that actually starts in 2025 if that's the trajectory we're going on. So the key point for us is if we're heading in that direction, we need to know by the end of this calendar year so that we can spend the bulk of 2025 getting into place the contracts we need, the resources we need, uh, sort of setting that arc for where we're heading in 26 and 27. We can't do that quickly. Uh, we won't be able to do it in a short amount of time. Uh, it's going to take a number of processes to be established, yeah. new contracts, uh, new scope. You know, everything has to be built in order to do that and deliver uh, along the schedule and cost that, that we've been requesting. Yeah, well, that, that makes sense. Uh, so these dollars won't go from CVWD to your, your authority until um, – the earliest is 2026, right? Carrie, is that a? Correct. Yeah. Is that correct? 
So we won't pay we won't pay these dollars in 2025 or pay. That them. is correct, but we will work on the funding agreements and that has to be in place so that we can set up the billing through the state water project. So there's administrative tasks that happen in 25 as well. So if we approve this action today I guess there's a lot of time then between now and and the money going hard. What happens if if met for some reason, I know this sounds probably far-fetched, but if if they if they decide that they're voting no, right? Um, what happens to our approval and commitment to make these payments? I mean, can we back out at that point? I think that we we really understand that if Met doesn't vote the way that we hope and think they will, that we have to reevaluate. So there would be a period of reevaluation where DWR and, and the DCA would work with the public water agencies and determine how to proceed. And if that determination is to stop, then then that money would not be collected. But there would be a period to develop that concept. Huh. Okay. Go ahead. What's the in regards to that question, John, Met, Met would have the same question, right? Hey, we're half the project, and we have to approve these funds, and what about all the other 25 other contractors, and you know, what, what are they going to do? So, I mean, the, it's kind of... Yeah, I mean, it'd be easier to fill a 2% hole than a 40% yeah. hole. Yeah. Yeah. What's what's the uh, the problem with, with getting the validation first before making more expenditures? So the validation takes some time. So we, uh, as, as Robert mentioned, we started that process in 2020. There were COVID-related court delays for several years. So it, it took a little while to proceed. And the longer that we take on the permitting and engineering and the further this project construction gets pushed out, we have to handle the difference in escalation of the costs. So we're roughly looking at about a half a billion dollars a year if we delay the schedule. So proceeding now and having this planning and engineering work move forward on the schedule we've laid out saves two to four years in the end. And so that's a pretty significant amount of cost savings from us proceeding before the validation is in place. So that yeah, we and I and I think I think that's some of the concerns that I've heard from it too is is all that uncertainty with the validation, you know, asking for more money spending the money and then getting to a point where you can't the project doesn't move forward yeah so so i think it you know it's like a i get what you're saying it's you know we want to move forward so that we can save money on the construction but you know there's also does it how do you feel about the validation is i i'm not going to speak for the lawyers but i think i feel pretty good so to back, to back up what the issue is with the validation case, uh, so we filed in 2020, we got the preliminary, the first ruling in the first court case, and the ruling didn't say that DWR doesn't have the authority to issue bonds. What we were looking for is a determination that the Delta Conveyance Project is part of the State Water Project, and they essentially said, you didn't give us enough information to make that determination. We filed it in 2020. We had just issued the notice of preparation for CEQA. We didn't have the project well-defined, so we had a pretty general description of the project in that first case because we didn't know what the project is yet. So it wasn't so much a finding that we don't have the authority as it was a finding that, that more detail was needed, which we now have. So I am feeling cautiously optimistic about this. It's hard for me to speak for how court will go, but. Generally, we think that there's a pretty solid basis for this project being part of the State Water Project, and it will turn out that way in court. So in regards to that, is the, is the sole question in the validation action that the State Water Project, that DWR has the authority to build the project, or are there other issues wrapped into that, like the incidental take permit, the water right, and the EIR? I mean, are those separate um, uh, tracks and process? Yes, those are all separate. So the validation case is really narrowly related to financing. So um, when we go to issue bonds, we ask our bond council to make a determination in the bond that we have the authority to issue that bond. They are, as you might imagine, very cautious and they mm -hmm. like to see it pretty directly laid out. So that's the purpose of this validation suit so that we can say that this project falls under the State Water Project authorization, and we have that documentation. 
what that does is it gets better um, security so we have better rates so ultimately mm -hmm. it, it turns out that um, we we have a better rating we get a better deal this is more efficient for the state water contractors that are paying for it so the permitting is completely separate okay so in follow-up to that so could could those other three issues I mentioned the ITP the water right and the IR it could, could those be derailers to the to the process and to the point of why are you asking for the money now I mean uh, you know we've been down the road before um, Robert had the slide all the way back to the um, uh, the two tunnels and all that is could these be derailers and could we be spending money ahead of time and then get derailed later so we're really setting up the process to avoid that I mean I think that the idea of what we're doing now we will have the ITP well before this funding comes into place right like we're looking at the ITP coming in in the next month or two so having that in place uh, so ESA and CISO will be done by the end of 24 uh, the water rights process is uh, it has started and will again be in the, will be done by the end of 26 as will Delta Stewardship Council. So what we're trying to do right now is set up the next few years uh, very well with the governor's direct uh, involvement so that we can be in a good place that when we come back in 27 to determine if the project should move forward, you have all of that information in line. You have all the information you need to make that decision. So that's part of what's happening in the next few years is getting those answers so you have that more that higher level of certainty. Mm -hmm. If I may? Yes. Um, one of the items added to the cost estimate was the $200 million for a community benefits program. Uh, I assume the major most of that money is going to be spent in Northern California, probably in the mm -hmm. Delta area itself. What types of things are included in that? So we've been working with the communities to develop what would be a part of the community benefits program. There are two key components. One of them is a grant process. So we would uh, provide grant funds for projects that directly benefit the communities that could be affected by the project. And then the other is what we sometimes refer to as implementation commitments, which includes some uh, processes related to the work. So job training, hiring targets, basically incorporating local businesses and people into the construction, and then also potentially leave behind. So like if we're building a park and ride and the community wants it to remain, that it could stay after the construction process is complete. So we've been working with local communities. Uh, one example that we are, are very close, I'd say, to, to getting our negotiation in place is that we are working with a community to build a fire station. So right now, we've incorporated all of the costs of emergency response into the construction estimate. We're assuming we have to do it ourselves, so we're building those facilities within our construction sites. Uh, there is a community near the intakes that is interested in having us renovate and improve their fire station and have an agreement that they would provide those services. So it has a joint benefit. So part of that is, is costs that we already had budgeted for emergency services, and then the increment uh, would be part of the community benefits program so they have an improved facility as well as some period where they know that they have some additional income to help with the staffing and that really provides the community a really in, a really improved benefit so that's a, a specific example other examples that that people told us they're interested in are water quality related projects potentially uh, levy improvements or flood projects uh, education improvements to education in the area so it really could be a broad cross-section, um, potentially buying, uh, helping them buy and renovate older buildings that would help their communities. So it's, it's, um, it could be a broad cross-section, but it really depends on what the communities are interested in. Okay. So the plan, the plan project would move about 6,000 acre feet and, and that could move, you know, if you utilized it half the year, it could move 2 million acre feet of water. Um, so, with that being said, and with all the um, environmental issues with the um, uh, current exports out of the Delta, um, with the two pumping plants, the Fed and the, and the states, um, wh what, I mean, could, would this replace that, um, those pumping plants completely? Because it looks like it could uh, if, you know, you could manage the storage uh, in Orville. Uh, and so forth. So it looks like it could, but what will happen to the other facility as this comes online? 
So we, I probably should have talked a little about operations. So we are planning to continue operating the state water project sort of at a base level, mostly the way it is now. So continue Oroville operations the way they are now and continue Banks operations the way they are now. So uh, during the winter and spring, we would continue to first divert water in the South Delta to the extent that we can. And if we run into regulatory or physical constraints, then we would opportunistically divert additional water at the North Delta facility, essentially capturing high flows when they're available. So we're expanding the capacity of what we can divert. Uh, during the summer and fall, we potentially would shift some diversions from the south to the north to help with water quality management. Uh, but that's a relatively small percentage of the operations of the North Delta facility. And the reasons that we're doing that, there are a few of them. Um, one of them is that not all state water contractors are participating. And so having the existing South Delta facility operate pretty much the way it is now makes the division of water much easier to identify so that the benefits are accruing directly to the participants. And also it's cheaper. The South Delta facility is less expensive to operate than the North Delta. So we might as well use the less expensive facility first when we can. So that's why we're looking at operating that first. So uh, we are not looking at, at, you had mentioned operating at half of the year. Uh, I think very roughly the percentage that would be south versus north is about 80% south, 20% north, but that's mm -hmm. very rough. Mm -hmm. But it gives you an idea that it's, it's much less than operating half time, but it's operating when it's really important to be able to capture that water because it's not available mm -hmm. beyond that time frame. So that's, that's, a, good, that's a good point in, in terms of, you know, it's, it's I don't know, I don't know how wide the pipe is. It's gonna be a big pipe, right? A big tunnel. Mm -hmm. And 6,000 acre foot's a lot of water to move through there. What's the minimum amount of water that can move through the tunnel? I mean, it just seems like, you know, that is it, uh, mm -hmm. maybe there's a question it, for me here. It, yeah, it's gonna end up being somewhere probably around, so it's a maximum 6,000 cubic foot per second conveyance. So it's a 36 foot internal diameter tunnel. Okay. Um, it's going to end up being more to the uh, sort of the mechanical limitations, how, how low you want to dial the pumps down, that sort of thing. So it could be as low as maybe 300 CFS. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's e each of the pumps. Uh, we've got 500 CFS pumps with variable frequency drives on them down in the South Delta. So it'll just become sort of an operational question of how low you want to go and what makes sense. Uh, there, there are certain times when that very low flow is important to just keep the water moving through the system. But mm -hmm. Uh, it's, in, it's designed to flow at a maximum rate, six feet per second, so it should keep everything pretty clean, but periodically we may need to, to just move water through there at a slow rate. Is the intent to keep the pipe as full as possible so yeah. that it has yeah. a better seismic survivability? So yeah, the intent is to keep it generally full. It would only be dewatered infrequently, maybe every 10 years or so for mm -hmm. operations and maintenance purposes. Other than that, it will always be flooded. Mm -hmm. It's not worth the effort of dewatering it. it. Uh, and yeah. you're right, it would uh, it improves the performance when it's full. Uh, having an empty tunnel is a pretty extreme condition from you know for a number of geotechnical analyses. So it's but it's designed to handle that. You know, it's designed to handle that extreme condition. But in general it would stay flooded. So it's thirty six foot interior diameter mm -hmm. and it's up to six thousand CFS. Correct. That's right. right. It's in between. And then um, just, just to confirm, this isn't creating any new water. This is for us to keep trying to get back to our... Yeah. Um, this is, uh, this is us getting back to the water. It depends right? on your point of view. Yeah, it's yeah, new. I, I think that Robert showed the slide where in 2020 it looks like there is additional water, but we know the project isn't going to be operating in 2020. Uh, we're looking at operations starting when construction is complete, which is around 2042. So by that point, we will have already experienced sort of losses associated with climate change and sea level rise. So that additional water diverted with the Delta Conveyance Project would be working to get us back to about the same level as we are now. So, so our, our table, what do you call it, table A? Mm -hmm. that, that's not changing, right? No. no. Just the percentage well, of what we're actually going to yeah, get from this. Yeah, we're getting to 50. We're at 
whatever there. percent we're getting down to 50 percent yeah i think the details of how we manage that we still need to work out in the next couple of years as part of a contract amendment process i think that there is uh, likely going to be an additional piece that is specific to the percentage that you would get of the delta conveyance project that would be sort of equivalent to table a so that's something that that would be changing as we go forward so yeah. to that point if there are uh, other contractors who don't participate then um maybe costs and benefits would be moved over to uh, to the districts that are participating? Yeah, so the, the Delta Conveyance Project, it's a really key principle that, that the benefits of the Delta Conveyance Project stay with those that are participating. So the, the operations and maintenance of the state water project overall would be attributed to everyone in the existing Table A manner, but the Delta Conveyance Project would have its own system with just those that are participating. That'll be an interesting arrangement. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No problem. I, uh, I'll make one more comment. I, I um. I, I don't know how difficult it would be to do this, but I I would feel more comfortable with, with a one year approval. Um, I think it'd be a good chance for for you both to come back. For us to hear uh, on what the progress has been like, if there's any new concerns. I don't quite understand if that would uh, create any issues for you. Um, if it's just more paperwork because we have to do another amendment for the second year, but I, I think I would I would prefer that. I think it just allows for, at least for me personally, to keep tabs on this. Um, this is something that um, has been, um, at least for me, hard to understand. Uh, obviously, we've been working on this for several years now. Project seems to be changing, and then we think we're getting there, and then we, we're not getting there, and so. Um, it has a huge impact, I think, to us on on some of our rates and things like that. So that's that's kind of where I want to land. I don't know if that's a huge issue, but just throwing it out there. I can maybe talk a little about the logistics from our end, but maybe you have something to add. Yeah. So I think from our end, um, that that would be a logistical challenge. You know, as I mentioned, we're looking for approval now, so that as Graham described, in 2025 we can ramp up for 2026. If you approve only 2026 funding now, it means that we would need to be coming back before we even start the 26 funding to look at 27 funding. So it's hard to have that gauge. You know, we we wouldn't be able to check partway through the funding to see if the the money, as you were saying, I think has been spent correctly and well because we would be needing to do it over a year before that funding would begin because we need to go through the process, the administrative process of setting it up within the state water project, as well as the process for the, D the DCA of putting contracts in place. So it would, I think, increase the amount of administrative work pretty significantly within the DWR and DCA system. And maybe you can talk about it. Yeah, Vice President Estrada, um, I think maybe you know a couple of observations on your, um, your comment. <clears throat> I think first is uh, staff has already kind of looked out, uh, you know, way well past like 2029, and I think at 11 cents per hundred dollars uh, of assessed valuation, um, I think the state the state water project uh, tax fund is actually in really healthy condition. So uh, that's just one comment. Uh, I think you know your other comment about you know, coming back and you know finding out what the status of the uh, project is. I think there's. Uh, I think that's a reasonable request, uh, and we can certainly do that. Um, I think there's uh, opportunities outside the boardroom where, you know, like during Aqua, for instance, you know, that happens twice a year. I think uh, Graham and Kerry are always there uh, to give a status update. Um, and then I think the third point is not a criticism of uh, DWR, so, you know, please, uh, yeah, I want to make sure you're not <laughs> staying right behind me, <laughs> um, is the – DWR process is a little cumbersome, I would say. Uh, so right now, I think they're already starting to work on, you know, a couple of years down the road on the statement of charges issues. Uh, and then I think uh, beyond that, I, I think maybe just kind of highlight a little bit of what Graham was talking about. I think ramping this up, uh, I think the DCA, the Design Construction Authority, which is, you know, sort of like the engineering um, auxiliary arm, you know, for D DWR and hiring consultants that uh, DW DWR actually needs. Um, you know, these folks are, you know, they, they're very talented. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think they want some, some idea that, you know, they're 
uh, they, they have a job, you know, past 2026. So I think, you know, the dollar amount uh, that uh, the state is asking for, and th by the way, this is a request from DWR, uh, the $300 million, 26 and 27, they did not parse that out. Um, you know, gives the consultants uh, the certainty, hey, you know what, I have a job, this is a real project. Uh, so anyways, I think, you know, th for all those reasons, I just want to, you know, to highlight. For good reasons. Thank you for Thank clarifying. You. Could, could we make our approval <clears throat> contingent on the approvals of Kern and Matt? That's what I think I'd like to do. I mean, I like the idea of the two-year thing, but mm -hmm. I get that it wasn't parsed out that way. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's a problem. But what about a, you know, since we're going for you know ahead of them, really the you should get the big ones first, I would think. Okay. Can we make this action contingent on their approval? Well, certainly, I think, um, you know, this is not effective till 2026 anyway. So, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I, I'm trying to think of the language. So we, it, w would you want to have that language baked in into the uh, our resolution? Well, one, one thing that may become complicated about that in terms <clears throat> of Kern, uh, you know, Matt's going to act as, as the Matt board. Uh, Kern may have districts that participate at different levels, and I think that Correct. in the past they've had uh, districts participate at a 50% or 25%, and so to write the language of a whole current participation may be a little difficult in terms of you know what the parameters are of what, what would consist of an approval, and well, we might be able to write some of that. I, I'm not sure. Fair. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think it's... I, and I think what um, we're asking for here, uh, President Powell, is to kind of limit our commitment uh, to our share of 3.78%. Uh, I think if there's, I think to uh, Director Nelson's point, if others are short or whatever, I think it's really up to DWR to figure out, okay, how do we kind of patch that gap? Well, well, or you unwind the, the project, and I want to be able to get out if they unwind the project. Right. right. I don't think our resolution contemplates that right now. Yeah, and if I may, this is really a question for you know Steve Abbott, who's working on this project. But most of the resolution has to do with CEQA approvals, which really should move forward regardless of whether you end up yeah. being part of the project. Yeah, that's not the part I'm concerned about. Right. So then, <laughs> uh, so then, section the six is the approval of the funding. Right. So I don't know how you want to parse if you could parse that out well it would be our okay yeah so our, our authorization for the funding for 26 and 27 would be contingent on approval by matt and substantial approval by kern yeah, um, something like that something like that i i, I think the I, I mean it's a good point john it's like what when when does when does the project work for DWR with the amount of funding commitment, and when does it not? And so, when would our money kick in, and when would it not? Right. And so, I think. Yeah. I think that's a that's a good point, and it, it, it so, uh, I, I think that's a really good point. I, I had another question about you know what the public benefit is if it's two point two, you know, are there going to be additional uh, if the ratio is two point two. Um, uh, it, could there be additional public funds? But that's kind of another question. But I think the issue that we're trying to figure out is when would our funding kick in to the project because of other because of the the big gorillas, I guess, uh, approving. And when would it? When would we just keep the funds uh, in our within our range? So I I can't speak with certainty here, but. Even though, and this is probably not what you want to hear, um, even though the board is taking an action to authorize funding at this point, until the funds are actually appropriated and sent, I believe the board has the ability to rescind that authority at a later date. I don't know. That's what I wanted to know is, are we cutting a, you know, when are we cutting the check? Is it, is it two checks? Is it one, one big check? 
We know we haven't approved the budget for those years. <laughs> we won't do that for a long time. Um, typically, it is included in the statement of charges for the state water project, so we do uh, incorporate it within that bill. I, I think I also just wanted to mention that that this has happened before, right? Like on California water fixes that took a turn mm -hmm. and that work stopped. We did work with the agencies to stop and, and readjust. So at that point, many agencies had already contributed dollars mm -hmm. towards moving forward with the California water fix. We stopped the project, we calculated how much was left and we worked with each agency to determine if they wanted a refund or if they wanted to roll that forward onto the Delta Conveyance project. Uh, we did cut checks for many agencies. So I think <clears> I just <throat> wanted to provide some reassurance that this is pretty normal. We've done this before. Like we can absolutely yeah. work out the plan of how to adjust if this doesn't move forward. And so I think the idea that, that if something changes, we will adjust, um, not collect these funds because it would be before then. And we have money that's in our accounts now that we would have to work to uh, figure out what would be needed to shut down and then return the funds. So it's not, there isn't a, an irretrievable commitment of resources here. Yeah, I think on page five of the Robert's uh, um, deck, um, it has funds showing that were transferred from California Water, to your point, from right. California Water Fix to, yeah. to the whole project and CDWD got 1.2 million mm -hmm. back on that. Well, I, yeah, no, I understand that. I mean, that doesn't give me a whole lot of comfort. I mean, you can go back to the peripheral canal and, you know, see that this concept has been sort of stumbling along for for decades, for four decades, five decades. It's been a – so we don't know what's going to happen. The future is un, uncertain. All I'm saying is we, we're so far out in the future, we're a little bit ahead of the uh, the larger agencies, and I'd like to see our financial commitment – contingent on their approval of, of, of funding mm -hmm. of the project, of those 26 and 27 year fundings. I think practically it will be, um, mm -hmm. but so if, I mean, is it, I mean, Robert, uh, well, since you're all here, I mean, could, could that, if we put that into our resolution, is that, um, is that gonna, that will kill the deal, I wouldn't think it would just be uh, kind of clarifying our position is that, and your position is that the project's not going to move forward unless there's a, um, uh, what, what is that, a, um, a, enough people to move it forward. Yes. So I, I think our preference was, you know, kind of leave the language alone, but I understand the, um, you know, the concerns here. Uh, and if I think what Carrie was saying uh, in terms of, you know, the process, um, when it gets to that point, you know, is, is not sufficient and there's additional language that's needed. Um, I'm just trying to think through, you know, the current issue because I think that's, that's going to be a really tough one uh, to put into, um, into words. Uh, I think Metropolitan, as uh, Director Nelson talked about, you know, they move as a block, so I think that's a little bit easier perhaps. Um, so would would you be comfortable with us just you know because metropolitan is the largest entity uh the 47 percent is you know not going to be easy to to fulfill uh i mean would you be comfortable with us just putting in some language about met i would yeah okay i mean the other option is we just wait and see what they do and that's the other option too you know Right, but then, but but then I, we'd have to do this. So I've I've already got an hour in this. Thing. Done. You need Sorry. to get the Yeah, you yeah. can do the secret without the yeah. money. And so, I, I don't think Matt is, you know, going until like the very last meeting of the year. And I think, uh, you know, we've been strongly urged by DWR to finish the process, um, you know, okay. in this quarter. So that's fine. All right. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll move approval of this item with one change that we make our authorization of funding for 26 and 27 um, contingent on approval by Metropolitan Water District. To approval of To approval the of, of, of their, of a, the similar action that they're gonna be taking up. Okay. I'd second that. So that would be in section six, which is the approval funding section. Right. Um, Director Aguilar, I know we haven't heard from you. Are, do you have any comments? Do 
Director Aguilar, it'll be um, star six to unmute. He had to drop off video. Okay. Um, well, let us know if he comes on. I guess I'd like to hear from him before we vote. We need someone from that as background music. I know. <laughs> Did, did Valley Water approve um, the, uh, the same resolution, just with different, their, with their agency information? You, are you, uh, when you say Valley Water, uh, I assume you're uh, talking Santa about Santa Clara Valley. Oh, uh, no, I think Santa Clara Valley is still waiting. Uh, I, I think I, I, I might have misspoken. Santa, uh, Santa Clarita Oh, Valley. Santa Clarita. Yeah, he did. Yes, sir. Yeah. You, you okay. say Santa Clara. Uh, yeah, they're so similar. similar. Sorry. I know. Yeah. All Santa the Clara is fairly large. They have to be so similar. <laughs> So via telephone, and so I'm trying to tell him how to unmute. Um, he said it's not working. Go ahead. So he's listening in. He just could not um, provide comment. Okay. And he said, "Go ahead." Yep. All right. Like he does not have any questions. <laughs> that works for me. Great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But that's not a vote. That's just. <laughs> so are are we ready to vote then? I think we are. Yeah. I I think we are, John. I would like to say, though, that I think that I think that the way it's written now and the operational aspect of it, uh, the de facto is that it's not going to move forward unless Metropolitan and a substantial uh, contingent of Kern, um, uh, you know, approve the project and, and get the um, the dollars rolling forward. Mm -hmm. um, so I, uh, I, you know, our whole uh, future depends on state water project and Colorado River water. So we know that we're certainly facing a de minimis of, uh, of supply in the Colorado River Basin. And, um, uh, you know, I think we're all in on state water project reliability. And when you look at the, the Wanger decision and the effect that it had on uh, 86 percent versus a 43 percent I mean it basically cut the supply um, uh, yeah. dramatically and you know we have biological opinions that uh, are causing that to be um, minimized uh, with our supply so uh, when we look at this valley I look at the state water project water supply being um, our supply so I I understand the fundamental concern that you have, um, but I, you know, I, um, I do believe that it would send a strong signal to the other contractors that uh, that there's a large support for this, uh, in in spite of what they might think. And I, you know, I'm not quite sure how the metropolitan vote would go, but um, certainly there's uh, about a 50-50, you know, support there, and uh, you know, it may go either way. And, and so if Matt did not go along with it, I think what's what they're saying is 11 million wouldn't do it. So it's not as if that dollar amount would be forced on you if Matt no. bowed out. Right. That's what that's, 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 right. right. that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, I, you know, I I see your, your comment that we're relying on State Water Project is true, but I would add to that that we're also relying on Matt. Because this isn't going to happen without them, right. and so you know, in many ways, that that our our uh, our future is tied to their actions mm -hmm. as well, you know. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, if anything, that the men, the slight, the small amendment to the resolution um, would recognize that, or at least call it out that that. You know that's part of the requirement of 
you know, what, what does success look like? It, it includes them voting yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I don't know. Fair enough. I'm going to vote. Are you okay with it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. Well, we do have a motion in a second. Um, I guess we'll do a roll call vote just in well, case Director Aguilar. Actually, no, on. Uh, uh, Mr. President, he just uh, advised me that he's jumping off. He's having too many um, technical issues, so he jumped off the line at 926, so we no longer oh, okay. need a roll call. All right. Well, then okay. all okay. in favor say aye. 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 That passed three, zero, with two absent. Thank, Thank you. you. So you don't have to come back then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Never did ask what the pipe is made out of. That was my other question. Sorry. There, I know that's fine. They're it's concrete. not going to change our it's decision. concrete. They're, it's reinforced concrete with a variety of other, you know, sort of fancy components. But these are precast segments, so they're large. You put like a liner on the inside of it? Um, so the, the segment itself, it's a one-pass construction process. So it's got gaskets that seal, connections and dowels to make sure that everything lines up right. And then it's the compression that, that seals. It keeps it there is a grout layer on the outside of it yeah. that, that uh, fills the annulus between the soil and the outside of those segments. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. they're cast, uh, precast segments. They're yeah. on the, usually for this particular design, it, I think it's a seven-segment ring plus a keystone. Uh, so that gets brought in, conveyed out to the head of the machine. And erected. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, it is an interesting process. It is interesting. Yeah, it's one of those things you want to watch. Okay. Yeah. It's I'm sure uh, you'll have big films. It's the state of the art in terms of excavation yeah. at this yeah. point, tunnel boring machines. Um, cool. You know, there's the old sort of drill and blast approaches for rock, but in this type of soft ground, this is the state of the art process. Okay. Yeah, and it's you. a sing single pass process. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. All right. Uh, on to something much simpler. <laughs> 7B's <laughs> approval of the California Colorado River Contractors Forbearance Agreement yes, for sir. the for the uh, future conservation agreements under the Lower Colorado River Conservation and Efficiency Program. By Robert. Right. Oh, um, so I think your comment, uh, Mr. President, you know, the last one about Metropolitan and you know their their discussions. So uh, they actually, Metropolitan had a, you know, one of their water, one water committee meetings uh, yesterday afternoon, and uh, which I watched. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about about an hour and a half, Graham, you think? Yep, they, uh, they, they, they took off, okay. Um, you know, regarding, you know, there uh, was no board action yesterday. It was just, you know, information. And uh, I think one of the board directors did ask uh, about, uh, CBWD and Desert Waters uh, involvement in this, and you know how that water is going to be kind of you know brought in, you know when. It, so, I think the staff you know kind of mentioned that they're working with us uh, on the uh, on the agreements, you know, on how to handle those uh, and sites as well. So, as far as making sure it's included in the exchange agreement, that, that, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So you know, let's you know, so they are thinking about that. Yeah. To of kind of close that discussion. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess we need that too, is to make sure it's included in the exchange agreement. No, we we're we're working with Matt on yeah. this. So thank you. Okay. Okay. So um, uh, thank you. So uh, the request before you is to approve the um, forbearance agreement for the California parties for twenty four to twenty six. Uh, and I think, as the board may have remember, uh, earlier this year we uh, you know the, this board uh, approved the twenty twenty three. Um, forbearance agreement uh, for you know that the pot of water created during that year so this is actually to cover the balance of the um, years of uh, conserved water you know uh, before the end of the um, interim guidelines so this is just the the most current table uh, of the uh, California's participation in lower Co uh, Colorado conservation and efficiency program that's funded under the um, Inflation Reduction Act. <clears throat> so California's contribution uh, over this time period uh, until 2026 is uh, roughly a little less than 1.2 million acre feet, and it's kind of broken down, you know, by these different agencies. You'll see CBWD occupies the first two. Um, so <clears throat> the um, 
so the, the rest of them are kind of outlined here. So I think um, the board probably uh, has been in the conversation enough to know that uh, you know, forbearance agreements are pretty common uh, when you know, these kind of uh, programs are implemented. Uh, so this is a part of the routine uh, process you know, for the California agencies uh, when we're intentionally not taking the full allocation. And uh, you know, this actually just provides the assurance, legal assurance, that the water is not diverted by a third party. Uh, and then also, I think Metropolitan, uh, to a lesser degree, and Reclamation, uh, to a higher degree, that their financial commitments, because uh, you know, for us, we're getting paid $400 an acre foot as the part, you know, part of the funding parties, uh, that their investments are protected. So in our um, agreement, uh, System Conservation Implementation Agreement with Reclamation, uh, as well as the other California parties, these are kind of baked in as a part of the uh, uh, conditions prior to uh, Reclamation releasing the funds uh, for payment. So anyways, um, I think the other parties, I think Metropolitan's uh, board has already approved this, uh, as has IIDs. Uh, so I think it's just us and then I think City of Needles uh, are the remaining ones. So uh, with that, I would uh, entertain any questions and um, ask you to consider approving this item. Pretty straightforward. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd move approval of the forbearance. Robert, if I could, um, and I've had this thought yes, prior, um, our groundwater curtailment at Levy only goes to 25. Is, And I don't know whether the board's interested in extending that to 26, but if we did, since most of the other ones move through 2026, we would need to have a new forbearance agreement as well as a new agreement with reclamation. Is that correct? I, I think that sounds right. Okay. Well, we got an early start and we maybe we, maybe we should, you know, curtail the curtailment for a year and see how it goes. I mean, mm -hmm. I, you know, we may to want push to, it out to, we 26. may want to get that going again. I agree. Yeah. I agree. You mean okay. start the replenishment, yeah. not extend the curtailment. Double negative. I say curtail, <laughs> curtail the curtailment. Yeah. Double negative. I yeah. can follow you. <laughs> Understood. I, I want to make sure I, I, I understand um, the action here. And uh, mm -hmm. is, this, uh, is this different or is it part of the other commitments that we need to make the other presentations that you were pre presenting on 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 the totals of the of the river as a whole of the system you know how so oh, I'm you know how you talk about um, almonds. I think Thank the you. need to reduce volumes on the entire system and the negotiations between the upper oh. basin and the lower basin yeah no uh, this, this doesn't touch that right uh, no, th this is completely separate. Uh, so this is like the interim uh, actions that we're taking. Uh, the, the other one, uh, Vice President Estrada, that we talked about was actually the negotiations, you know, for post-2026. And, and this, this only goes to 2026? That's, that's right. So these were the actions that um, I think, you know, the uh, commissioner requested, I think, back in 2022 uh, when the system, you know, looked like it was on the verge of collapsing. Uh, so, and this is the one where we've where we've already approved the thirty five thousand acre feet for three years, right? So right. that's the first one, uh, uh, first line on this table, and then the second one. I think the board, you know, just approved the, uh, the amended, uh, you know, following agreement is the mm -hmm. second line, so that goes until twenty twenty six. Okay, so we've already approved that, and so what's the di what what are we doing here? What so as I as I see it, Councilor, is. <clears throat> Everyone who's approved it already has agreed that they won't lay claim to our 45,000 acre foot of water, and we won't look at the accounting and, and say, um, and lay claim to their conserved water mm -hmm. to, to flow through the priority system. Mm -hmm. But we're agreeing that, okay, you save the water, put it up in Lake Mead, and we're not going to put that on our water order. That's, mm -hmm. that's just supply that we're going to leave in Lake Mead. Is that, is that a reasonable explanation i think that's a great explanation thank you <laughs> yeah that makes sense yeah okay thank you do we have a second i'll second um 
Thanks, Robert. All in favor, say aye. 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 Pass three out. Thank you. Yeah, that's easy. C, authorized solicitation bids for this construction of this Warp 10 T1 filter. Armando, good morning. Good morning, President Powell, members of the board, audience, uh, fellow staff. Uh, just for the record, my name is Armando Rodriguez, uh, engineering manager with the engineering department. Um, the purpose of the board's item is to seek uh, authorization to solicit bids uh, for the construction of the Warp 10 T1 filter uh, repair project. Uh, and <clears throat> what we'd like to do is uh, within Warp 10, in essence, we have uh, two tertiary filters, uh, T1, uh, that uh, on paper is a capacity of 10 and has been in operation since 1988. But we cannot do 10 MGD uh, because of its aging, um, and we can only really do 5 MGD. And we also have a T2 um, tertiary filter that has 5 MGD. So between that was that that T2 filter was uh, installed uh, back in 20, 2003. So between T1 tertiary filter facility that is aged, that is 36 years old, uh, we cannot do five MGD. We can only do five. And then with the T2 um, that was recently installed here, and I say recent, but it's really 21 years ago, the T2 filter uh, facility we're going to do only five. So we only can do really just do 10 MGD. And so this project is all about establishing uh, reliability, resiliency, redundancy, and really getting back to the capacity that we really wanted to see within the T1 tertiary facility. Uh, we just don't have it there. Um, it is, uh, we are of the six basins within T1 uh, tertiary filter, three of the basins are not currently in use and we experience a lot of media loss. Uh, this media loss is very expensive because there's anthracite coal and then gravel. And so we're barely trying to keep up uh, with the current demand. And the current demand is 18 non-portable customers, uh, close to 15,000 acre feet. But thanks to your approvals, we have done a lot of pipelines uh, on the non-portable water side along Varner, Frank Sinatra, Warner Trail, that we're gonna bring on another 21 non-potable customer, doubling the capacity um, needed uh, within these tertiary facilities to make those customers, uh, feed those customers with this facility. So I'll stop here uh, to ask if you would like me to continue with my presentation, or is there any specific questions associated with this project? Uh, not really. Armando, will this greater than 10, 10 MGD? Thank um, you. Um, good question. Yeah, so what we want to do is, like, like we said, we want to be able to reestablish the capacity, but more important also with resiliency, redundancy. We think we can um, establish a 15 MGD facility within the same uh, concrete footprint uh, within the T1 filter. And then at the same time, save money uh, by decommissioning T2 filter and uh, into a tune of uh, about half a million dollars annually. And by not operating T2, T2 is very energy intensive. All the backwashing that is required, all the scouring that is required, we think we can save an additional 38,000 annually electrical cost. Uh, so both from an operational cost is a half a million and then electrical cost is about 38 million. We can focus all our energy and all our improvements on T1, um, install cloth, uh, cloth disc filters, which are uh, more resilient, a lot better product, and then they're expandable. So we want to be able to see the plant grow, but we just ask another cloth disc, uh, disc uh, in, and we'll be able to um, more efficiently produce our tertiary water for the uh, 21 new pot non-potable customers that are coming. Thank you. All right. I make motion to approve. I'll second. Okay, great. All in favor say aye. 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 Pass 3-0. Thank you. Thank you. On to D. This is the update for the slope protection requirements. 
David. Good morning. Good morning. The purpose of this item is to authorize updates to the slope protection requirements within the stormwater section of the development design manual. As you know, our public purpose here in the Coachella Valley in the realm of stormwater is to provide protection to life and property uh, for the entire Coachella Valley from regional flooding, not the flooding that comes from the introduction of a parking lot or rooftops, which is the concern of the local cities. Uh, we're talking about tens of thousands of cubic feet per second that emanate from hundreds of square miles of watershed that surround the Coachella Valley and ultimately discharge into our main channel that bisects the valley, which you can kind of see here on the screen, the, the blue, light blue line. It's about a 50 mile long channel. It's the Whitewater River Coachella Valley Stormwater Channel. And it has the 100 year conveyance capacity of about 39,000 cubic feet per second. And we have a requirement for all properties that are adjacent to the channel um, when they are introducing structures within the channel uh, that they either keep the structure, or I'm sorry, when they're introducing structures adjacent to the channel, that they keep them either 300 feet away from the top of slope or that they install uh, concrete slope protection. And so recent engagement uh, with the public has triggered a desire uh, to engage with our, um, our on-call hydrology and hydraulics consultant to re-engage in the development of the, of the uh, requirement, the so-called setback requirement uh, for building adjacent to the channel. And so again, we hired NHC, who's our on calls, worked with us for years, uh, who understands the Valley. And uh, they took a look at other agencies throughout the American Southwest, Albuquerque, Tucson, Maricopa County, Arizona, state of Arizona, even the city of Austin uh, who had similar arid climates, similar soils, and that sort of thing to see what these folks are doing um, as it relates to requirements when building next to the cha their channels. And we did find a pattern of uh, throughout all of them. First of all, we should say that the approach to the slope protection that these folks were doing is pretty much aligns with what the Coachella Valley Water District, District has been doing. Uh, the only caveat is that they, they did have um, more options for developers, which is something that we're proposing here. Um, NHC developed this report, which is included in your package. We sent it around to six other engineering firms to take a look and see to it that um, the professional community agreed with the analysis. And in general, the professional community did. The three options that we are developed and that we're proposing here to include, again, are intended to provide some flexibility for folks that are building adjacent to the channel. Option one tends to be the most conservative. It's just a flat equation, and it gives you an offset in general throughout the valley that's gonna be roughly about 300 feet. And it doesn't mean, by the way, that you can't build within the 300 foot setbacks. It just means you can't put a structure that's gonna house people in it. You can put a park, you can put parking lot, you can put overhangs, anything else within that setback. The option two, uses our existing standards that we have now um, as it relates to investigating soil properties, cohesiveness of soils, um, slope in the channel, and the hydraulics within the localized area, the geometry of the channel, are you on a curve, are you on a straight uh, shot, those, those sorts of things, and allows you to develop a setback requirement based off of that. And we accidentally, I accidentally left it out of the, the K2 guideline, but if you look in the report, on figure number three, it does show the setback would vary throughout the valley, 150 feet in some cases, 350 in others, most of it's roughly around 200. So it does provide a little bit of um, a break, if you will, for the folks if they go into a harder look and they, they can take some soil samples and get a sense for what's out there. And then the third option leaves it up to the developer, depending on their appetite for what kind of engagement that they wanna do, recognizing that there's um, you know, uh, there's folks doing this sort of thing all the time and new ideas, new perspectives might pop up, new programs, those sorts of things. And it gives an opportunity for the developer uh, to engage on that front and see if they can come up with some better topic. So, or rather approach. So these are the three options. The intent again is to provide some flexibility for folks constructing near the channel. 
and uh, leave it open to um, a little bit more of a discussion and less of our current standard, which is just 300 feet or nothing. And I'll leave it to any questions you all have. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, I thought that was somewhat helpful to give the options. Um, I noticed they took out the, the uh, turf language uh, and for existing um, homes that are on the next to the channel with turf protecting them, does that have any impact on them? Um, most of the areas where we have that uh, instance, we've got, there is some concrete slope protection that's in there. The analyses that were developed in, in looking at the turf, um, there's been new developments in those analyses, um, which is identified in the report. And we've, and we've determined that the capacity for the shear capacity or the protection that a um, turf provides is not quite aligned with what we would, we would hope. But in general, the areas that are currently developed that are adjacent to where there's existing turf, um, there with a couple of minor exceptions, the slope is lined. But there is concern with, with providing, allowing for turf to be used as slope protection, uh, given the constraints with you know, water supply, the fact that most of those are different property owners. So how do you get those folks to guarantee they're gonna maintain uh, the slope protection mm -hmm. or the, yeah. the grass? Right. So, so the the answer is that this does not impact the existing. That's right, folks. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I guess I, di I didn't really understand completely the ask. Um, is the ask to provide? the three options within the manual, the development design manual. Um, um, and then I, I, I see there's some specifics on that. So could, could you describe the ask a little bit? Yes, it probably could have been worded better, but the ask is, um, so the current standard we have is that there's a, there's a requirement for three, if you're within 300 feet, mm -hmm. concrete slope protection or no structure within the 300 foot, that's the current requirement. Mm -hmm. So the ask is to introduce some flexibility into the development design manual that gives three options, dependent on the appetite for the developer, how they want to engage, uh, that would uh, provide um, some level of flexibility in general mm -hmm. for what would be required in that particular location. Okay. And so there's, there's new language introduced mm -hmm. into our development design manual mm -hmm. that provides all the parameters and the details associated specific to each of those options. Essentially, we're at, we're approving the red line document, right? That's correct. Yeah. Right. So we, we're we're keeping the we heard from we're keeping the status quo option and then adding two more, or even the this the three hundred foot is is now able to be modified. Yes, we're keeping the status quo option, which is option one, which option. is effectively the same, yeah. and then we're providing a deeper dive with option two. Then, and then option three provides for the developer to come up with their own approach that we might find, we may or may not find acceptable. Yeah. But just trying to leave an option open for somebody who's got some other ideas that we can investigate. All right. Make a motion to approve. I'll second. Okay, thanks David. Um, yeah, all in favor say aye. 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 Pass three. Thank you. Next is E, this is the Dan Charlton. Power controllers. Good so morning. Good morning. Again. Um, so uh, this authorization is to procure uh, 50 additional PLC panels um, for our phase uh, PLC upgrade project, which is phase three. Uh, the purchase agreements would be with Northern Digital, who has done all our work to date, as well as a new provider, Integrated Power Systems, in the amounts of 325000 709 and 377,228 respectively. Uh, the authorization also includes uh, a professional services agreement for NDI for programming of these new PLCs um, in the amount of $273,920 with a contingency of $33,123 for a total request of $1,010,000. Um, phase three of the project will get 110 of our 169 sites online with new PLCs. Um, 
I recall uh, with the state of master plan and the implementation in 2017, they were assuming that our component would be about $10 million. With this request, we'll be at $3 million and we have one phase left. So I'm very proud of the team, electronic shop and domestic for the work they've done uh, to be able to do a lot of the work themselves, uh, as well as uh, the programming component with Luis Maciel and Jeff Tapp. Um, we do have the money in the budget. We have 510,000 in the operating budget and 500,000 in the cap, no, 510,000 in the capital improvement budget, 500,000 in the operating budget. Um, so we feel we're very uh, comfortable that we have the money to do the work. Uh, it's a multi-layered plan. Um, we're gonna have a lot more information coming from the site, instantaneous data, data is power, power to make decisions, informed decisions. And we're gonna save extensive costs over the lifetime of the project. Uh, we went out to bid uh, July 31st and received bids on the 28th of August. Um, we had eight different schedules and we could award based on the schedule. Uh, we had four bidders. Uh, the two lowest bidders actually contaminated the schedules. Um, and as such, we're recommending that NDI uh, provide 20 of the PLC panels and IPS 30 of the panels. Um, with that, NDI submitted a protest in regard to a certification requirement and the location of their facility, which is in Florida. Um, CBWD evaluated the situation uh, and determined that it was in the best interest to split the award between the low two lowest bidders. Uh, to maximize the, the amount of panels. So we put out to bid 57 panels. With the money we have, we're able to award 50 of the panels. Again, which will give us 110 out of 169 completed. Um, the technical difficulties that they protested um, were deemed immaterial by our staff. Um, and with that, we would like to proceed with the award, a split award between NDI and IPS <coughs> to maximize the number of panels in the amount of $1.01 million. Um, this also includes, includes three components for NDI as far as programming, and bear with me. One is uh, autom automated demand response. We have 22 sites that were built 15 years ago that need updated programming so that when deemed appropriate, we need to curtail, we can shut those sites off immediately with new PLCs. The second is programming as a result of trying to limit on peak power. So we're developing programming that will shut off the pumps immediately when we're in peak power demand. Uh, last year, our water management analyst, Brian Fogg, saved over a million dollars in trying to run the pumps off peak. Um, and this will allow it to be instantaneous and we'll con continue to get additional optimization and save electrical cost savings. Um, and the third one is a request from Environmental Services, but it's for our own end's benefit, I would say. And it is um, that AQMD has requirements now with it, it, uh, to provide reporting of when generator runs uh, and to distinguish between operation and maintenance runtime and emergency uh, power runtime. Um, and it's, a, it's mandated reporting that starts in January. So the, gener the programming for the generator runtime uh, will help uh, meet the requirements of that reporting. So in summary, um, the, the request is 273920 for NDI programming, 325709 for NDI to provide 20 PLC panels, and 377228 uh, for IPS uh, to provide 30 PLC panels. And with that, I'll open it. So you're saving about five million on that initial ten million dollar estimate. That's what I wanted you to get out of that, yes, sir. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, honestly, it, the, the the best part about it is we're building a new program. It's going to take us to the next generation. All of our staff in the electronic shop worked on these, so the the knowledge gained is tremendous. Um, we have taken a a monopoly through Cypar and developed an Aviva system that's universal and it's gonna help us uh, induce competition in the future. So yeah, we're gonna save a lot of costs over the next 10 to 20 years with this implementation. Great. Action. I'd move approval.
Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Pass for you. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Written communications. None. Yeah, I didn't mm -hmm. see. We have a one item for information, which is the uh, year-end recap of the California legislative session. <coughs> Scott. Good morning, Mr. President, members of the board. Scott Burrett with the Department of Public Affairs and Customer Experience. Here with Cyrus Deaver, um, our Sacramento lobbyist who's been doing a great job this past year representing us in Sacramento. Um, you know, the governor had until September 30th to sign or make decisions on bills. Um, and so I just want to provide an update. You probably have information on all of these. There's a bill matrix in your packet. Um, but there were two bills that we sponsored this past year. Uh, the first one was AB 3198 by Assemblymember Garcia. That was the JPA bill for electrical service in the Coachella Valley. That bill was passed and signed by the governor. SB 1065, as you know, was the Chromium 6 compliance bill that failed. It was pulled by the author before it made the, had the first committee hearing. So we attempted to get an author late in the legislative session. We weren't successful. We put together a coalition of 24 other water agencies and water organizations. Um, we didn't get an author to introduce that bill late in the session, but we are working on an aqua legislative proposal, which is due this week. So we plan to submit that request and gain aqua support for the compliance timeline, um, either their sponsorship of legislation or at least support of legislation. And we're also working with the coalition that we put together over the summer. Um, so we'll keep you posted on that. There's going to be a uh, public notice going out and a board resolution that we'll be bringing back to the next meeting, um, gaining your support for that that legislative proposal right. going to ACWA. Right. Okay. Um, so there were a number of bills that we supported related to Prop 218, the Prop 218 process and rates. Uh, three bills, they all passed, um, which was good news. And we're busy preparing for the upcoming legislative session. Um, we're putting together the, the legislative and policy platform for 2025 and 26. We'll be bringing that to the December meeting. And you'll be seeing that to provide input previously before that. We also have a federal affairs contract that we'll be bringing in December. Our current contract with BB&K expires. And um, so we did go out to bid on that contract. And Cyrus is here um, to answer any questions or provide any insight on what's going on in Sacramento right now. They're on recess, but um, if you have any questions, then I welcome your questions, comments. Thank Thanks, Scott. Just want to say I'm looking forward to the That was kind of last minute last year for mm -hmm. some reasons and uh you you and cyrus have happy to hear you're working with aqua to do that and um yeah Thank we'll you. keep working it okay yeah i think overall we had a very successful year i know there was quite a bit of disappointment of a over the Governor's veto of Caballeros uh, 366. 366, yeah. But I think uh, we were, at least the ones that we highlighted, we were able to get through. So mm -hmm. I very much appreciate the efforts on you and your staff and Cyrus, uh, at least at the state level. I don't track the federal stuff as closely, but I think we also have yep. a good advocacy team there as well. Right. Okay. Good. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Mm. Next. So this gets us to board general comments. Director Nelson. Uh, no, no comments. Just no comments. So. I'm happy to see that you're bringing this back. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we had one last year, if I remember correctly. Right. Um, well, I don't, I don't remember, but 
but these are these are fun i think they they mean a lot to the employees and um i'm looking forward to seeing uh staff there thank you yeah more tired that's good i don't have any comments um um Let's see here. We're, do we have any board requests for future agenda items? Hearing none. On to the meetings. We had the September 25th Golf and Water Task Force. I was there. Um, kind of just people getting some funding for uh, turf removal. I think it's $2 a square foot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that seems to be getting some some uh, t uptake, so that's good. They kind of got really messed up on the weather this year. Um, their overseeding time, which would have kind of started right around the 25th of September, it just was so hot that um, it's going to make for some interesting seed stands out on these golf courses this year. Not ideal, let's put it that way. Um, let's see, September 25th through 27th, Colorado River Symposium, uh, Director Nelson? Yeah, that was in New Mexico, and um, it was a good conference. You know, um, uh, all the states were well represented. Um, it was had some interesting uh, sidebar conversations with Andy Mueller and some of the other agencies that are looking to, in Colorado, to... Um, purchase a, a 100,000 acre foot of non-consumptive water right use uh, uh, from a um, uh, defunct um, hydroelectric plant. And so that, that was kind of interesting conversation in terms of whether they should buy the right or whether they should put some sort of fish flow requirement uh, in the river to, um, to utilize water that would then flow down to Lake Powell. So uh, kind of interesting conversations there um, about the issues there. Had a good discussion with Tom Gibson. Thanks, Robert, uh, for that. Um, and he's the assistant uh, uh, director of um, the California Department of Water Resources. So he's uh, got kind of involved with Colorado River issues uh, from looking at it from a state perspective. Uh, that was good. And then uh, there, there was a seven panel, uh, seven principles panel, um, and um, the Wyoming uh, director, Brandon, um, had just learned that Pat Terrell was, uh, who has been a long time uh, water buffalo from Wyoming, and the principal for Wyoming had gone into hospice care uh, for some issues, and so he was... Uh, Gave a tribute to uh, Pat as well as all the other principals did as well. So that kind of took up a fair amount of that conversation, but um, um, that was good. And but the panel did get into uh, uh, you know what are we doing on the 2026 guidelines? And I thought that there was uh, uh, a, a good amount of pressure on the upper basin to show their work in terms of. Um, what they're going to do past the uh, lower basins 1.5 million acre feet. And so I thought there was good pressure there. I thought that uh, Carly Jurna, who's the attorney working on um, uh, a lot of these issues, provided a, um, a good explanation of what the, how the lower basins uh, proposal, the upper basins proposal, the Gila River um, Indians proposal and then what reclamation is doing kind of those four alternatives I, I should put in quotes uh, of uh, what reclamation is working on modeling in terms of the uh, proposed plan so um, Carly did a great job with that uh, Robert I don't know if, if we can get a hold of that deck but the deck might be helpful um, uh, at some point to show everyone else. I, th I thought it was a good presentation. So that, that's about it for that. Thanks. Um, the, the last thing listed is September 30th, our Retaliation for Principles meeting, which we had. Uh, and uh, we made a little progress, and we've got a couple more meetings on this calendar. Do we have any other meetings to report on? I had one, Mr. Powell, and, um, 
October 1st, there was a Section 5 contractor call, um, yeah, follow-up to um, the, um, the conference and um, kind of charting the course on moving forward through the process. That was it. Okay. Anything else? I don't think I have anything. Um, is there a motion to approve a per diem for the meetings reported on? So I'll second. Sec I'll sec motion. Motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Passed. General manager report. I have nothing uh, this time, although it is that time of year, sir, when I need to take a look at my goals and then uh, sit down and... Uh, have a discussion about an evaluation, so we'll schedule that uh, first round for our next meeting. Oh, I look forward to that. That's all, sir. Council report. Long meeting, so I will pass, Mr. President. Okay. Do we have any departmental reports? Carrie's getting up. Oh, yes. Come on up, Carrie. I just, good morning. I just wanted to do an introduction. Um, this is Robert Scholl, or Rob. Um, he's the new engineering services manager. Um, he just started yesterday. So he'll be overseeing our development services right away, survey and inspection group. So I just wanted to introduce Good. you so you have a face to a name. <laughs> Great. Nice to yeah, see Rob. you. Welcome. Yeah. Rob. Rob, where Welcome. are you coming from? <clears throat> um, yeah. Good morning there. Um, yeah. President Powell, members of the board. Yes, I'm coming actually from San Diego County. Uh, uh, previously worked with the Vista Irrigation District, uh, worked there for about four years, uh, then worked for uh, Vallecitos Water District for about 15 years before that, and then Otay Water District before that in Ramona. So a uh, few, few different water districts there in San Diego County. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, welcome. Welcome. Yeah, yeah welcome. Yeah, pleasure to be yeah. here. Thank you. Good to have you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you know what, I'll, can I do one as well? Yeah, go ahead. I have my new deputy clerk in the huh. audience. She's over there typing away, Janet Martinez. She just started right. with us ha have her come last up. week. And uh, do you want to just introduce yourself real quick, Janet? Sorry to put you on the spot. I have her taking minutes and, <laughs> and introducing she needs herself. To she needs to take minutes on, on uh, going up. She did. <laughs> <laughs> they made me do it. I got up. Good, Good morning. morning, everybody. My name's Janet, and I'm happy to be here. Good. Yeah, nice to meet and, you. And yeah. I'm, I'm a, I was a consultant, and I was previously with uh, Paul okay. Burgess Estates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank right. you, everybody. All right, good to have you. Nice but she did have, welcome. she has worked for various cities. She's just modest. She's worked for the c couple of, city of Bell, city of Burbank, uh, most recent Paulus Burgess Estate, city of Santa Fe Springs. So she has okay. worked for various municipalities. Great. Welcome. Great. welcome. Sounds great. Good. Well, at this time, the board will recess into closed session to consider the items on the agenda, which include the additional item that we added, and we will reconvene to report out following closed session. Uh, the regular meeting is reconvened. Uh, we do not have any reportable action from closed session, and with no further business, and we, we are... Did, and I'm sorry, we did not go in closed session on the third item that was added. That's true. Yeah, the added item we, we um, did not consider and that uh, we are, with no further business, we are adjourned.